Pain, good to see you here. Let's start up Mubot in the background. Mubot, gonna wake up Mubot. And you're wondering about 5B. I got 5A, but I'm struggling with the seats part of it. So let's go at the seats. Let's go grab some code for that and get it to work. The seats is basically another method to do the decomp. It's like everyone's got their own method to do decomposition. We need Mubot awake so we can find out the FPP3 book. I need to say both of these codes. Because for the life of me, I can never remember if I made the argument or the command FPP or FPP3. It looks like it might be FPP3 or FPP is the argument. Let's check it again. Mubot, is it FPP? And the answer is, he's going to do it again right here, maybe. It is FPP. That is the argument. So let's go look at the seats and run this. Okay. Time series decomp. Let's go to our main screen. Check it out. First question of the day is going to be, I'm rearranging Mubot here on the screen. And if you're here, drop those questions in the chat because we're just going to get some work done. And it is the first question at 210, BAS 475 seats. So assignment four. Uh, five, you said 5B, seats decomp. It's an acronym. Decomp. Okay. Well, let's go check the sound right here. Seats decomp. Let's go do it. Okay. So we got the book pulled up right here. Let's go into the seats. There's the seats method right there. And there it is. There's the seats method right here. So this is using, I think that's all the code we need, right? That's 5B and there's the seats, model seats right there. It's just the name of the model. And here's the seats where we're actually using the seats decomp. This is very important right here. That is going to use the seats uh, methodology of doing it. It's just another way to do the decomp. Everyone's got their own way of doing decomp right here, standing for seasonal extraction in ARIMA time series. So we're actually doing an ARIMA time series, which is kind of awesome. I think we have some decomps from earlier. We could compare these two. Um, but the, what an ARIMA is, is an auto regressive iter integrated, integrated moving average. The seats and X11 decomp looks super similar, but the response asking about the differences. Yes. So if I'm going to look at, uh, so the X11 and the seats, let's go grab these two right here and take a look. Here's what I would do. Here's how I would compare them. So let's talk about a good way to compare them. This Pepsi stock thing is taking up a lot of bandwidth. Okay. Here's how we're going to compare them. So we have here the seats. Do I have everything I need? I don't have components. It's mad. Only when you don't have US retail, right? Okay. We're going to make both these decomps. There we go. US employment not found. I think he creates that. So let's take. We're going to go grab one. We we're doing the Tasmanian stuff earlier. So let's do OS production, OS livestock. We were working with the Australian livestock data earlier, and we're going to make our own, and we'll see if we see differences. So the Australian livestock data right here, promise means it promises it's there. Kind of weird it says that. And we are going to go here and take from it filter. Is it state equals Tasmania? There's only Tasmania. Ooh, it's mad about something. Oh, that's what it's mad about. I should know better. Equals is save. Equals equals is uh is logical check. Let's do calves. No, let's do pigs. Pigs have <clears throat> pig the good. Pigs has more great job paint right there. Equals equals. Easy way to make a mistake. Not save into, but equals equals is logical check right there. And so now we have the filtered data right here. We're going to store into the object. I'm just going to call it data. Uh, these are called account. So we're going to make the seats decomp of the data right here. And then the variable we're looking at is the count. And there it has created it. It's creating the decomp components to which we can auto plot those in a moment. And the decomp of Tasmanian pigs, Tasmanian, Tasmania pigs, Tasmanian pigs. And now we should get the seasonal decomp right here. Cool. There's the seasonal decomp, but let's go get the, uh, not the seasonal decomp, the seasonal extraction. 
Let's go back here to just the regular old methods of using the X11, which is basically going to do, um, so can I use X13 on that? The X11 decomp on it. So now we have the X11 decomp and we should be able to go right here. There's the X13, but that is not what I want to do. Will it do it by default? I always forget the arguments for this sometimes. X11, mm, let's just revert. There we go. Here's the X11 decomp and here's the other one. Uh, we need to change our data set. We need to change our variable name. And there's that. And then we're gonna grab the auto plot right here. We're gonna drop an auto plot right here. Change the name of the decomp we're using and decomp of Tasmanian using X11. Okay, so there's the decomp using X11. There's the decomp and they're very similar. Mm -hmm there's some big differences there's some big differences okay so here's what we need to do we're going to store this into can you buy into one a and b yeah we talked some one a and one b you got it yeah definitely ship them so um you got it um we're going to store this into graphic one just call it p1 right there and then we're going to store this into graphic two uh so how are you doing Peyton are you following along with what I've done I've created two decomps and I'm going to look at them both here on the screen at the same time does this logically make sense I'm storing my auto plots uh, basically, we're just auto plotting and then we're adding to it labs labels for titles. So all this right here is just saying add to it this uh, add to it this title. Technically, I usually like to write my code on one thing. It is a little long, but I usually like to uh, do that on its own line. Following along makes sense. We've created two graphics. Now, this is where uh, we use a cool helper code ggpubr to do gg arrange. I've been a big fan of this as of late. But with GG arrange, we can go here and put the two graphics side by side. Uh, P1 not found. Now we'll find it. So now we're going to put those two graphics side by side right here to look at them and to talk about the differences we see. And this is probably going to be one of the best ways to communicate this information. So once again, I don't want to directly answer our questions right here. But when you look at this, we've got here the seasonal one. And then you've got here the X11. Now, there's something very clear to see, especially if you look at 0.8 to 1.4, a little bit clearer on that. Um, and also this right here. So really, I'm seeing some good stuff right here. What are you noticing? Which is something we would expect. What are you noticing right here? What are you noticing about the seats method versus the X11? Pretty clear to see, which is why it's called seats. Um, it is definitely doing this for us right here. Like yours might follow this, but we probably need to talk about some more. It's really doing a very different pattern for it too, kind of right under my nose. Um, but what are you noticing and how would we describe this to individuals? Um, yeah. And, and this is a good thing too. Uh, aside from, I don't want to talk about that yet, but that's a lot better. If you look at the scales over here. Yeah, that's really good. The seats decomp in the seasonal pattern. So the seasonal pattern right here is capturing more of the variation. And one quick way to look at this is the scale difference from 0.8 to 1.3. It actually dips a little bit below 1.8 uh, right here and goes a little bit higher. Um, there is kind of a little more bouncing around in here like this. Uh, but another thing to notice is the, res the uh, irregular when compared is smaller. Over here, this goes from 0.5 all the way to like 1.4-ish. And this goes from like 0.8 to 1.1. So there's a much smaller remainder. So the seats is doing a way better job uh, by virtue of it's capturing a lot more in the trend. It looks like it's a little more volatile in the trend. Um, the seasonal looks to be also. So I'd say the trend has more volatility in it where maybe there's some more miniature cycles being captured where this has a much smoother trend. So just think how you could look at these trends. This this is the same series. You're not going to see differences here because that's your original series to start. And then when we decompose it here in the trend, the trend has more volatility in it, as in more kind of shaking aberrations, which might be smaller cycles that it's trying to pick up upon. See, we don't even get that dip over here, it seems. So then over here in the seasonal pattern, we see a very different seasonal pattern with as much... Um, it's a little bit more consistent in amplitude. <sighs> I don't know. They're both kind of weird. I don't love either seasonal pattern. I'd prefer it be more consistent, but I might see more consistency in this seasonal pattern where it's picking up on just think about in the X in the seats. I see maybe a more consistent pattern with a little bit more stable amplitude, like amplitude is how wide the signal goes. So you could say, uh, you know, the plot doesn't thicken as much, 
We do have a bit of an issue here, but it's a little more consistent in the thickness and um, maybe a more stable seasonal pattern where this one kind of has like sub seasonal patterns. I really see like a sub seasonal, like a seasonal pattern within the seasonal pattern. Um, but I might like this one better. And down here in the remainder or the irregular, you can call it remainder, I like to call it that. It's clear to me, and this is where the seats is really gonna win. Uh, the fact that this bar is so big, look over here, the seasonal is not the is not so big. The remainder is bigger than the seasonal. That is a huge issue right there. Um, and then uh, what the rectangle means, yes. So the rectangle is like a perspective thing. The rectangle is the same size in every image. And what do I mean by same size? I mean like, pretend this is like a dime. Does that make sense? Like that rectangle there is a dime. Well, that's the same dime right here and that's the same dime up there. So that rectangle in the image is the same, is literally the same size. Does that make sense, Peyton? So it's like a perspective thing. It's like if I put a dime next to something, you'd be like, oh, this is really, really tiny because the dime looks really large. But if I put a dime next to this, you'd be like, oh, this is really big because that dime looks very tiny. And this is the original series. So most of the variation, and look at how this looks basically like the original series, most of the variation, also by virtue by looking at the scale right here, most of the variation is coming from the trend as is over here. But the second largest component in this one, in the X11, would be the irregular. And we don't like that because that's what we don't understand. That's what remains after we decomp, the things that don't fit into the trend or the season pattern. Because you notice right here, we have the trend, the season, and the irregular make up our original data. And so, or as this one says, it's a function. Our original data is a function of these uh, values, which just means there's some mathematics we can do to put them together where we add them or multiply them. And so down here on the bottom, it's like, okay, this is good because look at the scale, 0.8 to 1.1. That's a very small scale compared to this, which is in the, the thousands. So this right here is very small, a very small component of your uh, original series. So we want the rectangle to be the smallest. Uh, correct, good answer right there, 100 points. Great answer, yes. You would prefer, and that's a good way to understand it. <clears throat> and then we always wanna ask why? Because if the rectangle is smallest for the, the trend in the season, that's more of the signal. These are the signals. So this is like what we can learn about our, the uh, remainder down below is the things we don't understand about our data. So the remainder is what we are not able to capture in the signal, which these are signals for us. Um, this is going to be the cycle and the trend. So you can see a downward trend and some sort of bouncy cycles. And then you see right here, the seasonality is the over a fixed period of time. And is it, the seasonality is a little bit odd in this, but um, yours might be better. Yours might be more consistent might have uh, better amplitude, consistent amplitude, but the seats method looks to do way better. The number one winner for the seats method is this. This right here is the reason I'm going with seats because in the X11, um, the second biggest component was the uh, noise or the residuals. Yes, Peyton, great, great work Peyton right there. And then we see that the seasonal was not really picked up upon where the seasonal is a bigger component over here in the seats. Uh, so comparatively, and that's what you need to be looking at. So yeah, um, the biggest thing, this is why we have people interpret graphics is like, what is this telling us? Why would we use this one? Hey, Kayla, good to see her. You bet. We'll do some 1C, uh, C6 and 1E, you bet. Shivam's got a question, Lord Kayla's. So let's head over to Shivam's question and great job right there. Thank you so much everyone being right here. Love it. Got a class coming up here in a little bit. Okay, so BAS 475, I think she was looking at Simon 4, and then 1A and B. Let's take a look at those. We're gonna make some cool graphics again. Let's go over here to the main screen. Let's do it. Okay, well, let's go take a look at some graphics. 1A and 1B. Abigail, great to see you here. Drop those questions in the chat if you got them. Let's go over here back to the decomp assignment. 1A and 1B. Okay, so I kind of kind of do this, but not kind of do it. Let's go check it out. Which country has the highest GDP? So we got some basic questions here about GDPs. Oh, we oh some auto plots. 475, 4E, yeah, definitely. Let me put 4E on the list. I'm gonna make the list right here. 475, 4E. Brianna, great to see her. Drop questions in the chat if you got them. BAS 320, so good to see everybody here. And 1C and 1E. 1C, BAS 320, 1E. I used to not write down questions. That was a, 
That was a bad idea. Okay. So when we look at this right here, which country had the highest GDP per capita? Uh, so there's a few ways to do this. If you want to find the country that had the highest GDP per capita, we're doing the global economy. We need to look at like GDP per capita, right? Now, I don't think we have GDP per capita right now. We have GDP and GDP per capita means you do what to it? So let's first find how to get GDP per capita. How would you get GDP per capita? What is GDP per capita? You might have to Google it. So we'll do a little, we'll, we'll solve this first one right here. And then um, I don't want to do too much of it. Trying to help you. This is, yeah. Can we do, yep. What do we do to get GDP per capita? So we have GDP and uh, so here's your GDP. This is gonna venture into some, there's GDPs. And then what do we do to get GDP per capita? What do we do to get GDP per capita? Pretty sure GDP per capita means we take GDP and do what? Kayla just leading the way. Now here's what's really cool, Kayla. So we'll, what we'll do in 320, um, not to like teach things multiple different ways, is we'll take GDP and then we will divide it by GDP and population. That's the way to do it right there. You could then store this onto a data frame or store it into a variable X, take the variable X, go to, go to global economy, and on global economy, store it into like GDP per capita. So this right here will create this right here on top of it. And let's see it happen by going right here. We got so many things. All good. It's going to store it now. Watch. Boop. And there we go. So here it is. And it's on there now as GDP per capita. But we have another way of doing this with the dplyr methods, which is pretty cool, I think. We can go right here. And let's see if I can remember how to use the dplyr methods. We go right here and we go to global economy and we pipe it through into what is called a mutate. The mutate is going to say, well, what do you want to create? I want to say GDP per capita. We're going to do a different one right there. And now we're going to say it is equal to GDP divided by, and actually it auto completes, which is amazing, population. And guess what? We have just put that on there and we can then store this into, let's call it G2. And now we have that. So that's a different way of doing it. Uh, we achieve the same objective. Does that make sense there, Kayla? Uh, so if you take 475, you will see this methodology right here, which is going to say mutate and create a new column, but you could always create more columns pretty quickly. So the mutate just creates a new column on the data frame. So you don't have to save it onto the data frame and you might have to like rewrite it, but you know what we could do is now we could take this. I wonder if we could go here to filter, filter, and let's go to max. I wonder what will happen if I do this. Nope, doesn't like it. Oh, wait. Nothing, I get nothing. Okay, good. Hmm. Oh, wait, did I, how did I write that? Okay, wait. Still mad at me, it's still mad. I've got a way of doing it. Yeah, you did it like this? Yeah, I'll do it the other way. Uh, Adam, drop your way in the chat. I'll do it my way. I'll do it my way. Which dot max? We're gonna show the two ways. This is the way I would do it. Adam's gonna show us the dplyr our way. There's that. Oh, did I not create the, oh, I'm on G2. Sure, either one of these is fine. Um, which max? Global economy. There we go. Do we not have the, really, we don't get to see that last thing right there. Adam has this right here. He ran it through, he ran it all through. Ooh, nice. So Adam basically did the same things. We got the global economy right here. And then we're running the mutate. Then he created the variable the same way. This is just doing spacing right here. He filtered out up, oh, there's where it is.
It's a literally 320-474 issue. Adam, do you want to explain what the issue is? Do you want to explain what the issue is? I see it. I think I see the issue in the code. Um, do you see the issue? It's still there right now. This is the issue. Um, why am I getting that? It's because of what? And I should have saw it early on. I did see it uh, when we were looking at the GDP and I saw it right there. I see the issue and you're right. And I hate that this function does this. It got me, it got me good. Kayla, this is a 320 thing. We need an additional argument. Adam saw it, it was in his code. And so I think this is gonna fix the issue with my code. So the issue was what? Mm, not the underscore. Oh, do I have it? Oh, so actually I don't have it spelled correctly with the G2 thing. Oh, is that really gonna do it? No, nope, still problem. Um, well, that's Adam's code right there. Mutate, da, 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 da. all the underscores are good. Oh, we wanna use global economy. Where'd my code go? Yeah, the NAs, the NAs. There it is. No, don't worry, 100 points everyone right there. The only issue with my code was the NA remove equals true and I noticed it that there were NAs in the data. Sorry about that, I had to sneeze. Um, I noticed there was NAs in the data and if there's NAs in the data missing this, like we don't have values for these, that's what NA means is we, we just don't have values for those. If there is NAs in the data, if you wanted to plot the, plot the last Y variables in a data set, would I use the, I believe so tail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you could just save the tail. Bless you, thank you, Adam. Um, you could just use the tail of the data frame. Tell me if you have any problems with that, Shiv. Um, you can plot the last so many in a data frame with the tail of it, running the tail on the data frame. So let me know what you're trying, your thing you're trying to do. If you want to send me some code in Discord or drop in the chat. Um, but how are people feeling on 1A and 1B right here? So the goal is to plot the data and to understand it. And then we need to do some plots of it. So we have some other videos on plots, but this was really good right here. Just uh, working with a little bit of dplyr methods. So close, so close. The code was just one, one argument away from working. And then Adam went in here and added a select for the column and adam i just want to say 100 points again to adam right there uh doing a lot of great work right here we could go country comma uh this right here because we might just want to give the relevant info and there we go what does country do i mean what does select do <laughs> what does select do just think about telling someone what select just did look at the difference between my codes right here and tell me what select did which Adam knows, I think instantaneously, so I'm free to say too, but selected what, and I might display it this way to someone if I'm gonna report this information, because now we basically have that information right here. It is also giving the index. Um, yeah, Adam, great work. And it's just practice. It's just, uh, you start to be like, oh, I wanna take these columns. That's what select does. So select says, take these columns. You still get the index. The index is the time interval by which we're measuring stuff. So these are keywords we need to know. This is a crazy day. My body's like, what have you done? I woke up this morning, they're like ripping apart the apartment below us. And I just hear like, bang, bang, bang. I was like, well, I'm not sleeping in this morning. It's 7.30 for me. You're like, 7.30, that's sleeping in for me. It's not for me. <laughs> Let's go over to the main screen. We'll start off the next question. I think we're on to some uh, 320, right? It's on to 320. 320. Okay. Question 1C. Which one 1C? What, Kayla? Uh, you wanted 1C. We did a little 1C earlier. You were wondering about 1C6. 1C6. That's what it was. 1C6. And let's go right here, y'all. PS220. Assignment 5. Okay, let's go do 1C6. Assignment 5. Here we go. Okay, so we've got quote the value of the R squared and interpret its value. So when we quote the value of R squared, what are we looking at? R squared will come from what function, Kayla? Or does anyone know what function does R squared come from? Well, we need some starter stuff for this. So think that over while I get some starter stuff going here. I'm gonna do a different question than you have. So remember, 
Brian does similar but different work. So similar but different work. This is not your work. It's not the work you're looking for. We need to create a linear model right here in LM. The LM we need to create, uh, you have yours, I'm gonna have mine. This is my, oh, I don't have reg class going. Reg class is where all of our functions are. Now reg class is loaded up. So when I went here to load the data that's inside reg class survey 10, it did not load. Do note that if you type in something like survey 10, it'll show you what package is inside of. Now we could do correlation. That is true. That is true. Um, so okay, 100 points right there. We could do correlation. Uh, we have another way of doing it though. We could do correlation, but also we can explain someone's height. Everyone who's ever, if you take my eyes, you're like height and weight. What a novel idea. Height and weight could be explained in the survey 10 data frame. And once again, survey 10 is just going to be a Excel spreadsheet. There's height and weight, just like we're looking at Excel. I'm like, okay, just a uh, first person's height, first person's weight, six feet tall, 160 pounds, all that info. And now we're going to go ahead and make a linear model of it. And then from here, Kayla, what do we do? So it's a good pausing moment right here for hundred points. What do we do from here to then get a summary of the model? Like to summarize and, you know, let's take a look at this model. Let's just see what's going on right here. We're just gonna look at it and that's visualize the model. So there's a visualization of what we've created. This object M is the linear model. So we can see it and that lets us see what's going on. And you're right, Kayla right there, hundred points, summary. So when we go to summary, summary will get us the following value. We get multiple R squared and adjusted R squared. Now, this is a little bit confusing, I do admit. There, the R squared we are looking for is the multiple R squared. We are not looking for adjusted R squared. Adjusted R squared is adjusted for how many variables are in your model. It's a concept for another day when we start doing multiple regression, which funny enough, we are gonna take the multiple R squared. I wish they just called it R squared, but maybe they should call it simple R squared, but it just calls it multiple by default. But this is the R squared we are looking for right here. And that is the R squared in our output. So what does this mean? Who Does anyone have any ideas right now what the R squared means? So now that we found R squared, we have to know what it means. What does that value of R squared mean? What does that value tell us? Any thoughts on, oh, this means this. What would that value of R squared tell us? Take a moment right here and think, how do we interpret it? So we need to know the X and the Y variable. So we have to be like, okay, my X is this, my Y is this. What does this then tell us? Kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of. You might be thinking of correlation. Correlation tells us strength, direction, form, and unusual features. So correlation, correlation tells us strength, direction, form, unusual features. And so we could look at the correlation of this. It's not directly strength. Mad, oh, gotta put a comma here. So that's the correlation. Correlation squared, because correlations are, is R squared. So we can confirm right here that correlation squared is R squared. So that confirms that is the right number. Kind of, it does talk about residuals. R squared is basically, R squared can only be between what and what values, Kayla. So what values contains R squared? Think about if you square correlation, correlation can go as low as this or as high as this. R squared is contained between the values of what and what. That's a good general knowledge too for the test, even for 201. So, cause they've got this coming up uh, next week. So R squared is contained between the values of what and what? What is R squared contained between? R squared would be between the values of what and what? Oh no, that's good answers right there, Kayla. That's correlation. Correlation is between negative one and one. So if correlation goes as low as negative one and we square it, oh, did I not square it? Oh, is it? Wait, what? There we go. R squared is contained between what and what? R squared is contained between what and what? R squared would be contained between zero and one exactly. And that's why R squared is always gonna be blank percent of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. So R squared is a measure of the amount of variation in Y 
explained by the amount of variation in X that we have. So what we want is it really doesn't matter to us it doesn't matter if it goes up or down. What matters to us is that the points are tight around the line. Like we want the points to be tight. The sign is used in correlation to denote the direction, but the value of the slope is used over here to tell the direction. So we can tell the direction of the line, which would be positive or negative correlation by the value of the slope coefficient, but the R squared is a metric of the percent of variation explained. So that's a very common misconception is that sometimes people will call it like strength or correlation, but it's R squared, a metric of called the coefficient of determination. That's not important. R squared is basically the amount we understand in Y based on what we know in X. And we'd love for this to be as high as possible. To get a very high R squared, the points need to be even closer to this line. The closer they are to this line, the higher the correlation, the higher the correlation, the higher the R squared. But R squared is not correlation. That's the biggest thing to write down. R squared is not correlation. A good way to lose points on the test is to write something about correlation for R squared. I mean, you could write things that wouldn't be needed, but if you often write correlation, you might go in a direction that is not good for the test. So don't write about correlation, whatever you do. So how would you interpret this right here, Kayla? Take a shot at interpreting this by plugging in the values of R squared uh, for the value of R squared right here and the value of Y, whatever Y is in the context and whatever weight is in the context. So use this. Um, oh yeah, with the, so try to plug in the value of R squared right here and then try to plug in the value of Y right here and then try to plug in the value of X for this right here. So you wanna say something like this and change that to a percentage because it's gonna be a percentage of the variation in this right here, and then plug that in. Oh, and then multiply by 100. Kayla, you got it, multiply by 100. Um, yeah, that's the only, only thing you have to do. Yep, and then just remember R squared and correlation are two different things. Like R squared is the percent of variation explained, and then just change that to 36.13% um, because R squared ranges between zero and one. It's a percent of variation, so it's out of one, one being 100%, 36.13. Great job, not how much points, Kayla, great work. 36.13% of the variation in height is explained by the variation of weight. And some people say knowing weight gets us 36.13% of the way to understanding the variation in height or somebody's height. Uh, but does that make sense, Kayla, right there when we talk about what is R squared? It's knowing X gets us this amount of the way to understanding Y. And if you think about this, if you knew somebody's weight, if someone says, oh, I weigh 180, you'd be like, oh, maybe you're a little bit taller, maybe, I don't know. You don't have to be. There are people who don't fit this who have a high residual. There's people who are taller than you would expect to weigh 180-ish. But if someone says, I weigh 100 pounds, you'd be like, maybe, maybe around like uh, five feet tall. I don't know. Doesn't There's people, person who's 5'5", five, five, about 100 pounds. Person who's, uh, this person's a crazy outlier. I, don't, I think they misentered their data. They are they are 75 pounds and 6'3". I think it's misentered data because I am I weigh 100 more pounds than them. It's not just saying you can't weigh 100 pounds less than me, but I am 6'3", and they weigh 100 pounds less than me, and they're 6'3". So I think they misentered. Also, 75 pounds and 75 inches, maybe they just duplicated their answers. So over here, you see more extreme outliers, uh, individuals down here who weigh like 270, who are about 4'4", four four, uh, maybe. A very extreme outlier from the model. Um, but with this, we explain decently, I would say, most people's heights with their weights. Does that make sense? Like knowing somebody's weight gets us about 36.13% of the way to understanding their height. What's interesting is you could also ask somebody, you could ask them their gender. And if you knew somebody's weight and gender, now what? Knowing somebody's weight and gender, what, uh, right, what right here, Kayla? Knowing somebody's weight and gender, what? Knowing somebody's weight and gender would what? And just think about, does that make sense? If you knew someone's weight and gender, like, like if they're willing to tell you that, <laughs> if you knew somebody's weight and gender, that would mean what? That would get you what right there? If you knew somebody's weight and gender, that would get you what? Or there's a few ways to say it. So just think about that. Now we would know more info. So if we know more info, we'd have a better understanding about their height right here. So knowing somebody's weight and gender would get us 56.8% percent of the way to understanding the variation in their height or weight and gender explain 56.8 percent of the variation in someone's height does that make sense when i say that that 56.8 percent of the variation in somebody's height is explained by their weight and gender does that make sense 56.8 percent of the variation in somebody's height is explained by now it's x's and that's all we have to do in multiple regression is mention the x's when we do a multiple 
So 56% of the variation in somebody's height is explained by their weight and gender. Watch this. If I put GPA right here, GPA doesn't explain nearly as much. See how GPA really didn't do anything? GPA and weight explain about 36.13% of the variation in somebody's uh, height, where weight by itself explains 36.13. So somebody's GPA does not, doesn't really explain anything about their height. Like, you're like oh, you have a 4.0 GPA? That doesn't tell me anything about your height. That doesn't help me. And we could look at that by itself by going here. And great question, Adam, right there. Can you go for the... Yeah, let's go look at that here in a moment. Um, so this is a model looking at uh, somebody's uh, weight height with their GPA. And think about this. Knowing somebody's GPA gets you about 2%. I'm rounding this. 2% of the way to understanding their height. Or 2% of the variation in height. 2% of the variation in height is explained by the variation in GPA. And just think about that. That means if you know someone's GPA, it's not going to tell you that much about their height. And frankly, the very... Ooh, it's not due to random chance. That's interesting. There is actually something statistically significant here, but it doesn't seem what... To end off 100 points, but even though this is statistically significant, this model is statistically significant, it is probably not what. Although it is statistically significant, it probably isren't what. Most people are predicted to be about 510-ish to 59-ish. So that's about a 510 to 59. Very small difference among people. Boom, Kale right there. It's not practically significant. So even though it, there's statistical significance of this model, there's not really big practical significance. Um, I don't know. We'll look into it. Like maybe, maybe these hot, these outliers down here on the, or the extreme points on the end of the model are creating something that is pulling the model in a direction. But even though this is statistically, I would say it's not practically good questions right there. We'll come back to another 320 in a moment. Let's start with the main screen. Excellent work, everybody. Great work, Kale. Is that making more sense about when we think about what does it mean to interpret R squared? We got 4E and Adam was saying, how do I go about answering this one? Come on, on what the different y-axis values for seasonality mean in additive and multiplicative decomp. Do you right, no question. Comment on one. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> comment on what the different y-axis values for the season of seasonality mean in, in additive versus multiplicative. Yeah, so with this right here, um, so check out, we did a big segment here at the start. Let me show you, Adam. I'll show you right here. I'll show you the timestamp on it. <laughs> and we could come back to this if you like. Go to this section right here, Adam. Uh, the very start of this video, the first 13 minutes. Uh, you should see me going over that section right there about looking at um, the different decomp models. And so basically you're just trying to compare them. Does that make sense right here? We'll go look at the question again. Redo the classical decomp with the multiplicative. Are there any, are there any noticeable differences? Comment on what the different y-axis values for the seasonality mean in additive versus multiplicative decomp. So especially when you look at a multiplicative decomp, it's going to be what we're multiplying by. So that's a big thing right there. So yeah, I got them all. I was just not sure what to say about it. Basically, in the multiplicative decomp, we're no longer adding these things together. It's a value by which we're multiplying it. So you're going to see usually values closer to one. Like it's like a magnitude increase. Just think about, you know, if you add things, you're like stacking them on top of each other. But when you do, you know, the seasonality, so that's kind of the key to answer. The seasonality has an axis that's more of a magnitude change. So that's a degree in change of magnitude of the value. So you would take the trend component. We may actually have these graphics still up. Boop, boop, boop. I don't think I have a multiplicative decomp on the screen though. Might have one all the way back in time. Don't I have more plots? Oh, plot monitor too big. Okay. We're all, we're all the way back on stocks now. Back to class. Talking about stocks today. Um, doo -doo -doo. Two more seconds. We'll see if we have it. We should. I know we just we did some here at the start. There's our candlesticks eye. There's this is the end of class. Up. Oh, Here's our decomps. There we go. Did we do a multiplicative? No, I think we just stacked them. 
Um, this is a multiplicative decomp. So these are multiplicative decomps. Um, and we might be able to make a classical pretty quickly. So let me do Adam's question right here. Uh, but, 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 but. Jumping around, we're gonna do another 320 right after this. Assignment four. So uh, this is four D. Was it? No, four. Multiplicative. Or multiply versus add question. Sure. Oh yeah. Well, which one is it? This one's hard to find. Okay. Four D. Four D. Okay. So let's make a decomp right here in our 10 billion notebook assignments, untitled. Here we go. And we should be able to go in here and get, where's our classic decomp? Do we not save our classic decomp? There's the classic. Let me go grab them. Let me go grab an additive one. Um, if you need, need it, let me know. <laughs> we'll go grab an additive decomp right here. Do, 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 do. And there's the additive, pure additive, cool. Yep, okay, cool. There's an additive decomp, and we'll just take a look at these two. Okay, so let's go grab this. We'll store it as P1, um, US retail. We're not gonna use US retail. Do we still have our data stored? Let's reload it. Okay, cool, don't worry about the graphic state. And then we're gonna pipe through the data and do account. This is the smoothing window, the trend window kind of smooths across that window by which it looks at the model for the uh, trend. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Auto plot, cool. And now, now we need to go look at, uh, we're gonna go look at our seats model. Let's go store this as P1. And now let's go make our seats model as P2. And now let's go plot both of them on the screen at the same time is making the second graphic right there. And now that we've got them both created, let's go look at them. This is a great way to display stuff once again right here. Um, and you can tell, and you have to watch out because this is really not picking up on the seasonality so well right here. The seasonal component is actually a very small component. So I think you can get lost in it. That's probably, you know, I'm making an argument for the perspective thing here again, because these are based on magnitude changes now. So this is a big issue. So I'm, you know, we were talking about how to look at the scale thing over here, but once again, this is when you multiply the numbers together, this is a multiplicative model. And it's pretty evident to me right here because it's a magnitude change. Um, so it's doing this comparatively. And you can see right here, you're really not picking up, even though you're getting a more stable, uh, consistent seasonal pattern right here, your trend component is your biggest in the STL decomp. And then your next biggest component is the remainder. And we really just have a large remainder component right here uh, with a very large residual on that, or we just miss it. I don't care that it calls it remainder and uh, irregular. This is just what we are not able to explain, hence remainder or, re or irregular weird things, or residual to call it too for uh, 320. It is really trying to impose some regularity upon this, especially since we don't really get the difference in magnitudes possible with a multiplicative decomp. So, you know, right here, uh, we can see, even though the scale is smaller, this is a multiplication of numbers together because let me put it this way. Would you rather have $10 multiplied by a hundred, or would you rather have like a hundred dollars multiplied by one? So the question being, <laughs> which, and you, if you see it, you'll see $10 multiplied by a hundred, would you rather have that? Would you rather have a hundred dollars multiplied by one? Which do you choose? And then I'll tell you why it relates to this problem right here. I think Adam might be saying, I don't know if I did mine wrong, but they are like super, super similar. Yeah, you might see that. Well, you're looking at an are you looking at an additive decomp versus a multiplicative? So you should see the additive decomp is going to be you have to add these components back together. Um, like how much money do you choose right there? So if you do additive, you have to add this to this to this to create this original series. Just to make it clear, these graphics go in the following order. You are taking, and let's go to our cake analogy. You are taking a cake and you're breaking it down into these components. Can I, yep, yep. So here is the cake up at the top of the screen. Let's go grab a cake. This is the cake you are taking. 
and this cake You are going to do what to this cake again, Adam? This might help make sense, or other people watching might understand what these analogies are right here. What are you going to do to this cake right here? It's both of these graphics is your cake. So you're going to do what with your cake? You are going to do what with your cake right now? So what do we call this chapter? What are we doing with that cake right there? We're going to take that cake and do what to it? Hence what it's called. We're going to take this cake up here at the top, and we're going to what it? We're going to break it down. We're going to decompose it. So we're going to get all the major components from it. And of course, one of the most major components to a cake is the literal cake of it. So one of the first things we'd take from this cake is the cake, which is the major component. That's a big component of that cake right there. And by big component, we can see it over there on the scale because it's actually the biggest component over here on this one is the cake component. And that's the scale of it. The next thing we would take as we decompose this cake into its parts are going to be the icing. The icing is the other major component of this cake right here. And this relates to us because we're taking the trend and the seasonality. So you can see the icing. Now the icing is a smaller component. Now it's a little bit confusing, but when you see the bar being smaller over here, that actually means it's bigger. That's kind of the reverse. So you can tell over here, even though the scale goes from 0.8 to 1.4, I sent my two plots. Awesome. Let's take a look at your next. And then this is what, what's after we break down our cake. So after we take the icing, end the cake out of our cake. The last part is what what's out of our cake. We take the icing off our cake. We take the cake out of our cake. And then just using the words of how we talk about it, we have what what's for our cake. We have the what of our cake. Might not know what that picture is, but it's the sprinkles and stuff. It's the sprinkles and the little things on top of that cake up there. After we break down the cake, we would have the remainder. We'd have what remains. So our goal is that the majority of our cake is the cake and the icing. We don't want this randomness on top here, those random sprinkles to be the majority of the cake. Every cake will have a little bit of randomness, but we want consistency in basically the major components that it's a lot of cake, it's a lot of icing. And you see that right here in this decomp. And that's because this is very small. So, hey, Shreya is good here and Kale's here. Um, good to see you both. We're gonna do another Funfetti. I love it. Gosh, this cake looks so good. So when you decompose a series, this is the original series up here at the top. And then going down in order, we have the major components. Some series have more trend in them. Some series have more seasonality. Like some cakes have more icing. Some cakes have more cake. But you kind of need a little cake and a little icing. You don't just want to throw a bunch of sprinkles and say, hey, that's a cake. Some cakes are a bunch of sprinkle sprinkles in time series. So our goal is to break down the series. And then why do we have two different decomp decompositions of it? It's like you're asking two friends to take apart the cake. There's different methods for doing this. So you might do it with the decomp method. You might do it with the STL method or the seats method. And so however you choose to decompose it, decompose it is just your way of doing it. So that's got it. Let's head back over here and do a little, let me look at the screen and then we'll do some 320. Thank you so much, everybody. We got Shreya here. We got Kayla here. We're going to do another 320 coming up. I'm going to take a look at Adam's code right here. Adam sent the code. Let's take a look. All right, you've got the plots. I see the additive. Are you trying to get it all on one screen, Adam? So is the issue it's not appearing in one window like mine? Can you send me your code for the gas? There it is. I see it. Wait, auto plot volume. Send me your code where you create the gas data set. Send me the code where you create the gas data set. It looks like, oh wait, you have a, no, but you're just making one additive model. So the reason you're not seeing differences is because your first model is uh, is that you made an additive model and then uh, it's just a plot change title name. Does that make sense? Uh, so Adam, I'll, um, if you hear what I'm saying. So the only difference between P1 and P2 right here is the title change of plot. So um, doo -doo -doo, there it is with the tail of it. Yep. Lost production. Yeah, so the issue 
is um i'll send you a picture of it so the reason it's not looking very different is because this is all just your gas decomp which was done via an additive model and so p1 and p2 are created from an additive decomp and so for this one right here with the gas production go oh we're doing 4d right uh da, 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 da. so redo the cost of decomp with type multiplicative right are you doing 4d right now adam because 4d is going to have you redo it um yeah no worries no worries um yeah it's the problem is is that doesn't so the issue is redo the classic decomp with type equals multiplicative. Does that make sense? So the classic decomp with the argument multiplicative, does that make sense? So use the uh, additive. So the only change in your function is just a change to title. Does that make sense? Like right now, your only change right now is you've changed the title of the plot. But so take a look at the code I sent. What you stored into gas decomp is an additive decomp but changing the uh, title on line 12 of what I sent you to multiplicative won't change the, the way it was broken down. So we need to change the argument type. Does that make sense, Adam? I can look for some more on Discord later, but um, type needs to be, I'll point to it in the code here. We'll go to it real quick and then we'll do the next question. Um, this is what needs to change right here. This, does that make sense, Adam? This right here, is type additive for the first one. And then we have to redo the decomp, store it into like a new object and then do it via this method. So the second, when we do it again, we'll use type equals multiplicative and that will create a multiplicative decomp. Um, so this right now is not a multiplicative decomp, even though it says multiplicative decomp right here. Um, so I think this is fair to show. Um, even though it says multiplicative decomp, exactly, exactly. So you can tell it's not multiplicative because it's not being multiplied together. So um, watch this. Two seconds. Okay. Okay, now. Oh, did I just not blank the screen? <laughs> I don't know. Do it. <sighs> sure. <laughs> now, now this is a multiplicative decomp. Can you tell this is multiplicative decomp now? So the way you can tell this, how do you know this is multiplicative decomp? Like, how would you know this is a multiplicative decomp? Got it? Yeah, yeah. That maybe, I don't know if I actually didn't blank the screen or what, but I was like, I thought I hit my blank my screen button, but maybe I didn't. Um, but what tells you up here that it's multiplicative decomp? I see the, yeah, the equation is multiplied together. So um, you didn't blank it? Well, there you go. I just pressed, I went up to go through previous code and change the code that I had been running. So um, this is now a multiplicative decomp. We also, no, no, that's a string. There we go. <laughs> Let's go back to the main screen, do a little more 320. We got this. Last night was the stat tool one exam and woo. I'm woo, my arm's tired. I'm just, I just flew in from the stat tool one exam and boy are my arms tired. I wonder the first person who ever made that joke. You know, that joke had to have been made after like planes were invented. So that's probably like a not less than a hundred year old old joke. Oh yeah, totally, Adam. You're doing great. This is awesome. Like, it's all about that practice. How did they do? They did pretty well. The average was like an 81 and 82. 81 and 82 average. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, pretty close to the other sections, but I'm fine with that. We teach an online class, so I'm always here to show that online classes can do just as well as in-person classes. And we regularly show that. I want to do better, though. I want to do better. I want to be the very best, like no one ever was. To teach statistics is my real test. To train you in R is my cause. Stat 201. Stat 201. That is my goal. You teach me and I'll teach you how to code in R. 
One E. Obtain a 95% confidence roll for the slope. Let's go check it out here. One E. Oh, thank you so much for it there. It's it's not a competition for me, but it kind of is. <laughs> it's not quite a competition to have my students do well. Um, but it means a lot to me when they do. I want students to do really well. I want them to learn skills that help them, and I want them to have a good time. Somewhere, put those in a certain order. And then you got our goals here on the channel. Well, we're going to learn how to make some confidence intervals right here for the slope of a regression line. So when we give someone the slope of a regression line, let's go make a model. I'm just going to throw in some code for a model right here. If I were to make a model, we're going to go here and load up a data set. This is practice code and showing us how to do it. If I make a model, what am I getting for the slope in the intercept, Kayla? So I'm making a model right here, predicting height from weight, classic. We're getting a what for the slope and what for the intercept. The summary, we can get to it. The summary will give us insight into what these things actually are. They're not truths. We do not know the truth. We actually are getting what's. We're actually getting what's right here. The summary helps us understand these are what's. Ah, use the words of the summary. What kind of predictions. The model makes predictions, so we do get predictions from our model. But we are trying to what the intercept and the slope. So we, we do get predictions from our model. We're trying to get estimates. Great idea right there. Perfect answer. We're getting an estimate of the intercept and an estimate of the slope. Now, be careful. The intercept is not here. It's actually off the chart a little bit. Great job, Shreya, too. Excellent. We're both 100 points. So we're getting estimates of the intercept and estimate of the slope. Although this says weight, it's the x variable. So that makes it the slope variable right there. Now, tell me this. Kayla, if you say to your kids tonight, um, do you say, we're going to have dinner at 7 p.m.? Or 7.30, I don't know. You say, yeah, we're going to have dinner at 7.30. And then you put dinner on the table at 7.32, and your kids say, but you say we're having dinner at 7.30. And you're like, I was giving you a what? What would you say to, to them? They'll, they'll say, Mom, or I thought we had dinner at 7.30. Or I say to Chelsea, I say, Chelsea, let's have pot pies tonight at 7.30. And she's like, yes, pot pies are awesome. Those Marie Calendar pot pies are the absolute best. And then at 7.32, I pull the pot pies out of the oven. And I say, here's the pot pies. And Chelsea says to me, Chelsea, <laughs> Chelsea says to me, but you said 7.30. And I say, but I was giving you a what? What would I say? I say, I was just giving you a this. I, God, that sounds mean of me. I wouldn't say that to her like that. I'd be like, I was just giving you a this. I was in the kid mode. I was in the kid mode. Gosh, that sounds mean. Don't want to sound mean. I was giving you an estimate. I'm sorry. We would never talk that way to each other. Gosh, ugh. don't say that. Don't be like, who's Kelsey? <laughs> <laughs> or Pelsey, Popeye Chelsea. That's when Chelsea and I are eating Popeyes or Pelsey and Prian. So um <laughs> it was Kelsey. Um so with this right here, we would uh we, <laughs> we would say to our children or our loved ones, I was just giving you an estimate. I'm sorry, I was just estimating. Because any amount of estimate, when we say 730, and this is a key thing to know, it has standard error to it. Now, any estimate we have has a standard error. Well, but standard error, Kelsey, standard error, we know of it by another name when we give an estimate. You would say to your loved ones, this estimate I'm giving you has a certain amount of, and think of a U word whenever I tell you what I'm saying to you. You say 7.30 is when I'm giving you dinner or 7.30 is when we're having dinner. I don't give Chelsea dinner. And you give your kids dinner and Chelsea and I have dinner together. But I would say 7.30 is my estimate, but I have a certain amount of what in it. And if I'm not teaching or last night had a lot more uncertainty with the test, but um, if there's nothing too much major going on, oh, I just said the word, um, uncertainty, exactly. Good catch on the word. I was like, <laughs> I just said it. Um, there's a certain amount of uncertainty when it comes to estimates. There's a certain amount of uncertainty, like, I don't know, you know? So do you want large uncertainty or small uncertainty? You'll see why this all applies here in a moment. Do you want a large amount of uncertainty or a small amount of uncertainty? You want a large amount of uncertainty or a small amount of uncertainty? You want a small amount. And it's relative, right? Think about this last question here before we interpret what this all means. If I tell you um, this car that you're trying to buy is $20,000, but I could be off by about $10, would you say that's a big deal or $10 or whatever? That car over there that you want to buy is about $20,000, but I could be off by about 10. That doesn't mean I'm off by 10. It means maybe about 10 ish, you know, when you say, we'll have dinner at 7.30 plus or minus about five minutes, your kids are like, okay, that's cool. Five minutes, five minutes, 7.30 plus or minus five hours. And they're like, 
Wait, so we're having dinner at like midnight? What's going on right here? Not a big deal, right? But what if you say to somebody, well, that was the other example. Here's a candy bar. It costs a dollar, but I could be off by about $10. They're like, well, what do you even mean? Then the candy bar is free. You're going to pay me to buy this candy bar? That's so much uncertainty in the price of a candy bar. If a candy bar costs $1 with an uncertainty of about $10. So now the $10 for the car is not that big of a deal, but the $10 for the candy bar is huge. When you look at this right here, here's the estimate of what we think the intercept is. And here's the amount of uncertainty we have in it. So I think the intercept is this, but it could be somewhere like this. I think the slope is this, but I could be off by about this amount. Does that make sense? Like, I don't know. The slope's about 0.07, but maybe 0.003 away from that, like plus or minus. Now, not perfectly, not perfectly, but this is the big concept right here. When we create confidence intervals, it goes back to stat tool one because 95% confidence intervals use a z-score of what? 95% confidence intervals use a z-score of basically what? Here's a hint. 95% confidence intervals use a z-score of basically what? Not exactly, not perfectly. Two, great job, Kayla, right there, two. So what if we just took our estimate of 0.073 and went up two standard errors and down two standard errors. So 0.073, and then we add to it. Now don't do this. I'll show you the easy way in a second. We add to it two standard errors. Oh my gosh. Two standard errors, 0.0806. and then we subtract from it two standard errors, we've actually just created a 95% confidence roll, 0.0658. That is our 95% confidence roll. What is the relevant? Oh yeah. Is that part of the question? Yeah, definitely, Sherry, you got it. So that was a lot of work, but here's the thing. All that work I just did right there, is done for us by going to confident of our model. And the thing is, you say, Brian, your answers are not the same. Two is not the exact value to use. This uses the T statistic. And so this right here is the exact interval calculated with all the decimal place accuracy. But look at my numbers. My numbers are 0 0.0658, which is basically 0 0.066 right there. And the second number was 0 0.080, which is basically identical to the next decimal. So all you have to do, if you were to see right here, what is 0 0.6 times two? Just do this, try this real quick. What is 0 0.6 times two? And then we'll go over uh, Shreya's question here next. What is 0 0.6 times two? Just tell me 0 0.6 times two is what? Close enough with round, exactly. What, and so Shreya, what is 0 0.6 times two? What is 0 0.6 times two? So 0 0.6, which that basically is, this is basically 0 0.6. And what's times two of that? Because we're just going up two standard errors. We're just going to say, let's go up two standard errors. 1.2, right? So how about I go to this value and I add to it 1.2 and I subtract from it 1.2. Well, guess what? Those values I just found, take a look at the values I just found. 55.14, very close. 57.54. Very close, down to the first decimal place accurate for both of them. And what did we do? We just, add, we even rounded it and we just added two standard deviations and subtracted two standard deviations. If we were to do a 68, I think it's level, there it is, 68% confidence interval, guess how many standard deviations this is away? How many standard deviations do you think we go up and down to do a 68% confidence roll or standard errors rather, same thing almost. How many standard errors do you think we go up and down to do a 68% confidence roll? So now we're doing a 68% confidence roll. And what have we done right here by going up and down? How many standard errors? It's the same concept from 201. That's why 201 is so important. 
a 68% comps roll is just going out how many standard errors from the uh, estimated value. Just one. So tell me, I am right now estimating, let me do this. These here are my estimates for a what percent confidence interval. Like if I'm doing, if I'm doing it by hand, which I don't need to, this, these are estimates because I went out three standard errors. I went up three standard errors and down three standard errors. This is going to be very close to, or decently close to a what percent confidence interval. Ah, 68, 90, 95, 99.7. <laughs> I gave you type it. And there we go right here, 58.1. And there's the number right there, 58.1 and 54.5. And the reason we don't need to do these by hand is because the code does it instantaneously for us. So the question says, and that's about the confidence rules right there, obtain 95% confidence for the slope. Uh, does the interval suggest the regression is statistically significant? So Kayla, what kind of line is not statistically significant? Tell me. Line A, B, or C. What kind of line is not statistically significant? A, B, or C. Which one of these lines would be likely by random chance if there is no relationship between X and Y? A, B, or C. Oh, no worries. Pizza disaster. No, no worries. Which of these lines is not statistically significant? A, B, it's B, right? B is a flat line, which indicates no relationship between X and Y, because if you change X, Y does not change too, which then they're not really related. So what do you notice about this interval for the estimate of weight? The We don't estimate the slope to be what value, which is very important to say if it's probably statistically significant. The estimate of the slope is not estimated to be this. And this is a pretty much a shorthand of what we're trying to do. And that's the answer to that question up there. We do not estimate the slope to be what, which means it is statistically significant, or we do have evidence of that. Well, evidence of, yeah. We do not estimate the slope to be what? Oh, you see it? Sure, you got this, you sure? I think I have time for a few more because Shrey had a big question too. We do not estimate the slope to be this value. This is not contained in the interval. And it's, don't, the answer is not 0.05. Boom, both of you right there. That's all the point buttons right there. You both got it at the same moment. And flat being zero. There, we do not estimate the slope to be zero. I've been still on top chat this whole time I'm on top chat. YouTube, I don't want to be on top chat ever. So we do not estimate the slope to be zero. And we estimate, even though these numbers are small, um, they're still positive and it doesn't go through zero. So a lot of people look at this interval and you have to watch out and they say, oh, 0.05 is not in the interval. 0.05 is when we're talking about P values. Zero is a very important value for the slope because a slope value of zero means the model is not statistically significant flat line. So make sure you know that. And Shreya, we'll do your next question next right here. Let's do it. Shreya's wondering about a little music rod here. It is it is getting hot in Texas again. What a what a crazy idea. Like I need to turn on the air after this. <laughs> I can actually like feel it getting warmer. Let me find Shreya's question. Da, 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 da. Thank you so much, everyone, for swinging by. Da, 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 da. Uh, Shreya, what's your question? Again? I just got just got some grades posted. Thanks for. Oh, you're welcome. No, thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Isaac, for working hard on those. Um, it's Isaac to thank. I've just communicated with my TAs. Um, it's a little, it's a little disaster in TN as well. No. Can we please go over with the reference of the? Oh, do you want to do like the full output talk about Treya? Is it a question on the assignment? Awesome. And this is like a general question, right? On what the output means, right? So we're gonna show what the output means. Reading regression output. Let's take a note. I have the house open up today. Oh, cool. Oh, like yeah, to get all the airflow. That's awesome. BS through 20, assignment five, reading regression output. Okay, let's go take a look at regression output. Okay, so to get regression output, just a general, you bet. To understand regression output, we first need a regression. A regression is fitting a linear model to data. And you see right here, the red line, which is the model. And those are the predictions for people's heights based on their weights, which is the X variable right here. Awesome. And then we are going to take and get our summary of this model, which is just going to tell us things like the coefficients and all this stuff right here. Let's go ahead and take this and understand every bit of this code. We got enough time right here to go through all the code and then we'll have class. Yes. Let's go grab this code and let's explain all of the output, every last bit of this output. Okay. So help me out right here. I'm going to ask you the questions. A great answer is always, I don't know. But feel free, 100 points for all these questions. 
what does this tell us right here? Uh, so what is this telling us up here at the top? What does that first thing tell us? We're just going through each step of this, understanding call LM. Uh, what does that mean? What does this all tell us right here? I'll put some hints on here as we do this. What does that first thing in yellow tell us? The X and the Y variable, correct. So the, this is what the model was made from. It is predicting height based on weight. Uh, exactly. So how does X, how does X explain Y? And remember, this is the formula for it. It's always Y tilde X comma data equals. Adam can tell you, Adam, do we use that a lot? Can we go to the 475 for E? We might, we might. Yeah, let's try to do that, Abigail, you bet. So um, I think we might have just enough time. We'll do it. I might run over there and turn on the air. Wait, watch this, ready? Two seconds right here. Be right back, turning on the air. <laughs> Oh, did I not mute? I don't know what I do. What did I do? Oh, I did this. There we go. Uh, can I just talk about it? <laughs> no. Um. So next we have the what's. What do we have here next? So what are these? What are those? And there's a pretty extreme one. So what are those on the screen right there? There's a pretty extreme one, and I see something right there in the chat too. Uh, in chat too. What, what do we see right there? What do we see right there? What, what's going on with that? What do we see? Uh, it is the five number summary of, of the, great job Kayla right there, it is the five number summary of the residuals. So it's the five number summary of the residuals, and I see something kind of major right here. Yeah, of the residuals. So these are the biggest misses in the model if you go to the max and the mins, and we could probably find that person over here. Uh, do you see the person who had negative 23 as their point? Do you see the person with the negative 23 as their residual? I think it was negative 23, something like that, negative 21. Do you see them on this graphic? The person who was the biggest negative miss. So we could be like, ooh, there's a big extreme negative residual. And do you see them? Do you see them? Right there. That's them. Uh, because they are the furthest away. They're negative 21 units below the line of their prediction. So that is the biggest miss right there. Uh, the most positive might be this person over here. That's the person who's uh, missed where the model... Kayla right there. Excellent work. So we can tell if there's some extreme points by looking at this. So this right here will give us a good understanding of do we have, you know, very large residuals? Good to see you here, Alea. Excellent work. And next we get into the super important stuff right here, which is mainly what your assignment's over. This is big, important stuff right here. So with this, we should know very quickly what this is. Can anyone tell me in notation what that is? So what is notation of estimate of intercept? And it is what it says it is. It's what you estimate the intercept to be. And it might help if we write the following. Y hat equals B0 plus B1X or you know, B sub 1. So what is that? What is that value there that says intercept estimate? The intercept estimate is also known as what in notation. So use the equation up here to help you out. Ah, uh, not the Y hat. So the Y hat is the predictive value. The Y hat, good answers right there, Kayla. The Y hat is actually the line itself. So the Y hat is actually the predicted values. So the Y hat is actually the line itself. Um, this value right here of B sub zero is right here. So that's the value of B sub zero is what we estimate the intercept to be of that line. And then B sub one is not, don't, don't say for one unit change on the test, but it, if that helps understand it, that's always good. Just make sure your interpretations, we did interpretations earlier today. So this value's right there. So, mm -hmm, so B zero, exactly. B0 is the intercept and uh, the line itself is the line of prediction. So that right there is the line. And then the X variable would be down here on the X axis. 
Uh, so that's the X variable. Now the actual values of Y are the dots themselves. So if you see actual dots on this chart, those are the actual values. So there's difference between the actual and the predicted where the line gives predictions, but the actual values of Y are the actual. And that right there is just the name of the X variable. So whatever the name of the X variable is would go right here as we see the name of the X variable right here and the name of the Y variables over there on uh, the Y graphic at its height. So you do see the name of the X variable in multiple spots. Now the standard error is just our what in these estimates repeated again, which is not more complicated than that. It sounds super complicated. Standard error, standard error, residual standard error. It's just our what in those estimates. Like, oh, I think that uh, that car costs about $10,000. Maybe I'm off by about this much. Standard error is just our what in any estimate we make. An easy way to remember it. So uh, not quite residuals, not quite close, 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 not residuals. Whenever you give an estimate, you'll always have a certain amount of, should I get it work right there? You'll always have a certain amount of uncertainty. So whenever you give an estimate, you'll always have a certain amount of uncertainty. Now, residuals even have uncertainty. So residuals have a certain amount of like variation in them, like uncertainty, like how big is our residual? Eh, it's usually about 3.554. That's about how big the usual residual is. That's what residual standard error is. How much might I be off in my estimate of the slope? Well, maybe about 0 0.0036. Yeah, no, this is practice. So you're getting it. Now, this is where Shreya's question comes into play. These values right here coming up next. So we understand what the, the, un, the standard error is. It's uncertainty. Just sub in the word uncertainty whenever you hear that. Don't think of it as anything else. It's just like, well, I'm probably off by about this much or this much for that estimate. Eh, maybe about that much. It's not that you are off by that much. Eh, maybe about that much. But if you take these numbers right here and divide them, that will give you a ratio. Who can solve in their head 56.348032 divided by 0.589459? Who can solve that in their head? I can. It's 95.59. Now, do you think I solved that in my head? What do you think? So the question was, who can divide 56.348 divided by 0.589459? I said, in my head, it's 95.59. I can, I can show you. You'll get right. No, I promise I did in my head. Now, once again, check out what's happening right here. How do you think I'm actually solving this? I promise I'm not doing it in my head, or am I? You never know. How do you think we're actually solving it? Oh, look, it's 59.59. I was right. If you've asked me the next digit, I would have had some trouble. Exactly. It's that number right there. Though that is the ratio of your estimate to your uncertainty. Now, what would you, now we talked about this earlier. Do you want a lot of uncertainty? Like, what do you want? A very, what uncertainty? What do you want relative to your estimate? You'd like the ratio. So this is just a ratio of these numbers. You'd like this ratio to be big or small. I kind of flipped the question a little bit there. Would you like that to be a big or small ratio? And we don't want lots of uncertainty, correct? So would you like that to be a big or small ratio? Like when you compare your estimate to the uncertainty, you want your uncertainty to be small, which means the ratio will be this. So you want your uncertainty down here on the bottom to be small, and then you want your estimate to, to be what? So would you like the ratio to be big or small? So if you take the estimate and you divide by the uncertainty, which it's very small uncertainty, the ratio, which is what we're looking at over there, the ratio is hopefully very what? The ratio is hopefully very what? Hopefully very large. We want a big ratio, correct. And when you see T, just always think about a Z-score. T's and Z's are basically the same thing. T's are just calculated more exactly due to William Gossett and Guinness Beer. Um, but T's and Z's are nearly identical and they do converge to the same distribution with infinite degrees of freedom. It's a little more static than we like to get. It's just a ratio of like, how big is our estimate to the amount of uncertainty we have in it? So we want a big estimate compared. So that's exactly it. We want small uncertainty, relative large estimate that will give a big ratio. Now, the bigger the T value in absolute value, and that's why it says absolute value here, the bigger it is, the what are the P value? The bigger the T value, the what are the P value in terms of absolute value? Because the sign, it doesn't matter. the sign doesn't matter. The sign just indicates if the estimate was positive or negative. We care about in terms of absolute value, how big this estimate is. Is this a big estimate? 
the sign doesn't matter. So the bigger the estimate or bigger the T, which is the ratio of the two, the what are the P value? Smaller, exactly. So what is the smallest possible slope to obtain? Just like pretend we had different output here. I'll re-erase this here in a second. But what would be the smallest possible slope to obtain? The smallest possible slope to obtain would be what? If you were making a statistical model, the smallest possible slope to obtain would be a slope of zero. And if you obtained a slope of zero, then your model would look like that. Obtaining a slope of zero means your ratio would be what? What would your ratio be? So don't think too hard about it. Think zero divided by something. Your ratio would be what? Your ratio would be what? If your slope was zero and you had any amount of uncertainty, as long as it's measurable, your zero over something would be what? So you're just taking zero dividing by it. You can use the numbers on the screen and try, try the numbers. Zero divided by anything will be what? So we're just going to standardize this now and turn it into a T value. It'll be zero again. It's just zero. Now here's the thing to remember. This is the least significant slope. This is the slope most likely by random chance. So what would the P value be? Be careful. This is the least significant slope. This is the most likely by random chance, most likely by random chance slope. What would the P value be? The P value would be what? This is the most likely by random chance, the least significant slope. The, the most likely slope, if there is no slope, is to find a slope of zero. So the p-value would be what? Be careful. We're breaking the trend right here. It's the most likely. It'd be bigger. And since it's the most likely, it'd be what? You're right on the right track. Since it's the most likely, it'd be bigger. And it's the most likely by random chance. It's very high. It's the most likely. You're on the right track. 100 points. I haven't been throwing points lately. Oh my gosh, what am I doing? It's the most likely by the biggest. It's the biggest. What's the biggest? It's the highest. It was the highest. Kayla right there. Another 100 points. It's one. That is the most likely The most likely thing to see if there is no slope is no slope. If there's no slope, the most likely thing to see is no slope. Does that make sense? Like, if there really is no relationship between X and Y, that's the most likely thing to see. Hence, it has the highest p-value. That would be what we'd expect to see. And that's when we talk about, like, null hypotheses. Um, but I hope maybe there's some aha moments like, okay, that is the most likely thing to see. That's what the p-value is telling me. Like, that is what I should be seeing if there is no slope. Now, there's other things you could see that are likely by random chance, but that is the most likely thing by random chance. So I, I don't know. I was, I don't know. I love p-values. <laughs> love Chelsea more though. It's like Chelsea p-values. <laughs> They're way down there. It'd be, it'd be Chelsea bunnies, bunny one, bunny two equally tied p-values. Last but not least, we have the little bits of the output right here. So we've got the residual standard error. And with the residual standard error, the residual standard error is our what in the residuals. So use the word right here. The what. <laughs> I love you more than p-values. I should put that on like a love card error. Um, the residual standard error is our what. I do. Oh, they wanted us to say I will for our wedding. And we were like, can we say I do? And then he was like, I will is an active thing. I do is in the moment. And we were like, but we understand that. We understand that we're saying I, I do for forever. I do and I, I will and I do. The residual standard error is our amount of uncertainty in the residuals. The residual standard error also goes by another name called the root mean squared error. Error is just residuals, but I want you to see this. If I cancel out the mathematical things here, if I cancel out the mathematical things, what are you left with? This is the same thing as this right here. If I cancel out mathematically, what are we left with? The RMSE, yeah, that's the RMSE, great job. And what are we left with? We're left with mean error. So that's, how would you describe that? That's the average error. So th what is the residual standard error? It's the average error, like, which is kind of a, how much do we, how off are we typically by? Like how uncertain am I when I make a miss? So it's the typical miss the model makes. It's the average error. Um, but if you cancel out root mean square error, it just goes down to mean error. Do not worry about degrees of freedom. Do not interpret that part of it. That is used to calculate things like F and T statistics. Uh, the multiple R squared is the R squared we care about. And that R squared right there is the classic blank 
percent of the variation in y is explained by the variation in x and we would input here the blank percent so that's going to be uh for this model 36.13 percent of the variation in height is explained by the variation in weight adjusted r squared is something we haven't gotten into yet but adjusted r squared i'm not going to go into too big of detail now it's adjusted for how many variables are in the model it's a way to compare models of different size adjusted r squared is basically a penalized r squared where r squared can be negative so your adjusted r squared is a fairer way to look at multiple models adjusted r squared is always lower than r squared the lowest possible r squared is zero zero is the lowest possible r squared so listen carefully to this because this will help for later tests the lowest possible r squared is zero zero percent of your variation explained r squared adjusted is always lower than r squared because it's adjusted down so what do you immediately know about r squared adjusted because it's always lower than r squared and r squared um adjusted or r squared can be zero r squared goes to zero and r squared adjusted is always lower than r squared and this is why we don't interpret it either but what would you know now because you're like wait a minute r squared goes to zero but r squared adjusted is always lower than it so r squared adjusted is always adjusted down to like compare models fairly it can be negative exactly it can be negative which is kind of weird a lot of people wait i thought r squared couldn't be negative well r squared can't be negative r squared adjusted for multiple comparisons of models can be negative so the fact that it can um it's always lower <sighs> some statistician is going to join the stream except when r squared is one okay statistician joining the stream saying well let's go over the calculation of the coefficient of non-determination statistician person <laughs> my brain suddenly remembers all the theory i know and it's like okay the only instance when they're equal is when r squared is 100 percent but if we get that that's kind of weird it's, we actually it's weird we don't want to make perfect models because that tells us something's a little bit off the f statistic uh not that big of interpretation here in regression but that's the ratio of what we observe being explained over what we would expect uh so we see about 394 times the variation explained versus what we would have expected due to random chance so this is this is very very unusual if this is due to random chance and the overall p-value of the model um i should use different colors because i've already got those on the screen for the r squared if anyone were to pause i don't want them to grab the wrong values um the overall p-value of the model that is super important that tells us right there that model is statistically significant outliers can do anything to correlation to regression they can do anything so really good stuff let me go send the let me go send the announcement about class I think we have time here real quick. Announcement about class. No. Class in 10 minutes. I tell you, time just flies. I look and I'm like, it is. I'm like, I, didn't I shave this morning? Shave this morning? And I'm kidding. I, <laughs> Good. Go to class. Class in 10 minutes nine minutes rather class in 10 minutes see you soon click here and there's the link sending it out let's see here i think we got time for that last question you're welcome shrey i'll see you guys in class guys gals everyone all pals see you here in a moment guys i'm from new york so i think there was a question on 4e i'm gonna try to talk about this briefly abigail if you're still here, i think it was abigail was asking um let me go see if i can find that Compute and plot the seasonally adjusted data. Remember to turn your decomp. I'm going to throw some help right here. Let's throw some help. Go to the main screen. So you're welcome, Abigail. I'm going to throw you some big help right here and discord me if you're stuck. Um, so the book has a really great way to do the decomp. I just don't know how to plot it. I gotcha. Watch this. You ready? Uh, where is it? So the book has a really great way to do the decom and plot it. 
Um, so, oh yeah, this is good stuff. Um, the seasonally adjusted. There it is right here. So this right here, Abigail, um, this is a great way to plot it and get a really good. So if you look at what we're doing, um, we're taking the decomp. So here's your decomp object that you have. Like you, you stored the decomp, like you're saying, you said, um, you said where I just saw it a moment ago. I just don't know how to plot it like you have it. Yeah. So we have the decomp object and then we're doing aesthetic, setting the X equals to month. Then we're taking, and I think your decomp object might already have, and this is cool because what this does is this overlays, uh, the seasonally adjusted on top of this. So you get kind of a cool plot right here with it. It's got the trend and the seasonally adjusted. So you could actually remove off the trend, um, and do a fewer model, like a smaller model but this should do it right here. You could remove out the trend component, but is this making sense right here, Abigail? I could send you this, or I can put this link in the chat right here, but uh, this right here, this link with this code right here, as long as you change uh, your variables, cause you're not gonna be doing employed cause your Y variable might be something like count or gas or things like that. Um, but how does this look good for you, Abigail right here? Does this make sense on what to do? I'm gonna set the timer. Oh, great job, Abigail. I figure, and I want to say a huge thank you. People are working so hard and I really love the code of what we can do with this because there's so many kind of like quick little codes that just get so much done. And that's got, I got the timer ready to go. Yeah, no, no worries. That was, that was your, your, if I, if I say, here's, here's how to do it. And you're like, Psh, I got it. Look, if Kayla, Kayla, are you still here? If I say, Kayla, if I say, this is how to do it, would you be like, okay? Or would you be like, uh, and if you know how to do it from this, I'd be like, Kayla, you are just like rock star. But um, this is where we want to get people to. And so Abigail, 100 points to you right there. But Kayla, if you can do it from this too, then you are just, you're you're getting up there. That's awesome. So we're trying to raise up everyone. We're trying to like get those skills up. If you're stuck on anything, let me know. I'm streaming here in a second again. So I'll see people in class, but keep up that great work. We're going to keep practicing. We're going to keep encouraging each other. And we're going to keep working hard. So we all just lift each other up with that. We got this. I'll see you in class here in a moment. We're here to encourage each other. I love it. Bye for now. Bye.